Hello and welcome to the last video about the making of Cinderella's ball gown. So first of all, how can we already be here? I mean, it has been seven months since I first began this journey, but still. So it's time to make the bodice. Before we get started, a quick run through about some details. So I was having trouble finding the right fabric for the bodice and I was getting kind of discouraged. I knew there was a layer of silk crepelin on top, but that under fabric with the one with the iridescence in it, I just wasn't finding anything. So I got some options, but neither of them were really going to work. They just weren't right. So then I found this one. So I will link it down below. It's not perfect, but it has the right look. Plus it's silk. So that means I can dye it with the same dye as the skirt, which means same color. So on that note, the bodice gets an ombre dye. I learned this from someone who worked on the bodice. And at first I really wasn't sure how it would work. Like, what does it look like? I don't get it. But then I watched the dance scene however many times. I have no idea, too many probably. But I found it, I saw it, and I was like, yes, that is what it needs to look like. So there you have it, that's the ombre. So I did need to test how ombre dyeing works. It's actually pretty easy. It's just a matter of letting the darker part of the ombre stay in the dye longer than the upper. So here's my little test piece that I did. I am pretty happy with it. Now I just need to translate this success into the real bodice, but it actually wasn't too hard. So something else to point out, I was going back and forth about adding straps to the base bodice or not, but then I saw this photo and you can see elastic. Yes, you heard me right. They are elastic straps, which kind of makes sense because that means you can like move your arm like that. So I am adding the elastic for my straps. The bodice pattern can actually be purchased and the links and all that will be up above and down below. But on that note, instead of bringing in my previous patterns from my other five Cinderella dresses into the mix, I started from scratch. The reason for this is one, most of the patterns were for my customers who had different measurements than I. And two, I cut my upgraded versions of the bodice which turned out the smoothest of all my bodices. And I cut them on a bias. And I thought that might be the correct way to do it. But I learned and saw that the bodice isn't cut on a bias. It is cut on a straight. So a new pattern must be drafted. And that is where we get into the start of the sewing section of this video. You might notice I have the opening in the front when in the real bodice, it's in the back. I have it like this because I work alone and I would like to be able to fully pin up the opening to see how the whole bodice fits. This mock-up fit surprisingly well, but there were still adjustments to make. So I cut the mock-up apart and smoothed out some of those fit issues. While I was at it, I made some adjustments to the seam lines to make sure they matched the original which pulling up a picture while you trace out that shape really helps. After that, it was on to mock-up number two. This time I assembled it as if it was the final bodice, within reason. So I sewed in the boning channels and added the elastic to the straps and just some other things. And I did do a back closure this time. Though, as you can see, I used a zipper. I find it a very easy way to get it on yourself, but also give a nice even closure without much of a hassle. I was extremely happy with the fit of this mock-up. There were a couple things to adjust, as with anything you always see little things to adjust, but with just those small adjustments, I decided to go on to the real thing. Kind of scary. Honestly, I probably should have made a third mock-up just to be safe, but mock-ups are really my least favorite thing to do. So I, I tend to just kind of cut it a bit short sometimes on that process. Anyway, for the fabrics, I have my white iridescent threaded silk fabric, which will be ombre dyed, and a fine linen, and then last, a silk crepelin, 
which was dyed at the same time as the skirt fabric, so it's the same color. First, I'm going to cut out my iridescent silk so I can get the dyeing process started. Because I'm dyeing it and there's going to be some shrinkage, I'm adding a good inch of extra allowance all the way around the pattern. And just FYI, my pattern pieces don't have the seam allowances added. It's just easier to see the actual shape of the pattern and also know exactly where the sewing line is. Once all the pieces are cut out, I'm going to quickly baste them all together as if I'm sewing the bodice, though I'm not going right on the sewing line. And I'm also making sure to align the waist line. The reason for sewing the pieces together before dyeing is because I want an even ombre around the entire bodice. If all the pieces were separate as I did the ombre dyeing, once the bodice was actually sewed together, you'd get a varying look of the ombre with each of the pieces based on how it was inserted into the dye. So the bodice is together as it will be when the bodice is actually assembled. So onto the dye bath, I am using the same concoction of colors as my skirt dye bath, but I am adding a little less dye compared to the fabric weight. With the ombre process, I decided to use a hanger attached to the top of the bodice, and then I tied a series of strings to the vent hood above my stove. So I can have this bodice sitting at various heights during the dyeing process. The standard process of ombre dyeing is to constantly go up and down in the dye bath so as to not create hard lines in the ombre. But because of my test swatch, I knew I could get away with some sitting in the same position, but not too much. So I tried to not let it sit in the same position more than about two minutes. So for about a half hour, I moved the bodice from one string to the next lower, to the next lower, and so on, and then back up to the top. So during this process, the bottom part of the bodice is in the dye for the longest amount, and the top is in for the least amount of time. This creates that ombre look. Once the time came to add the setting agent, which is citric acid, I did a constant motion up and down during this time because it only takes a couple minutes for that dye to set, and I didn't want any dye to set at one point and leave a line. And there you have it. And you might notice this. Um, that's where I let it sit just a bit too long at one point, so it has a little more of a distinct line in this area, but thankfully the silk crepelin helps blend that in. Also, at this point, I'm trying to decide if I want one or two layers of the silk crepelin on top of this iridescent fabric, but after looking at it a bit more with the skirt and such, just one layer of crepelin made the bodice a bit too light compared to the skirt, so I decided to go with two layers of silk crepelin. Now that the dyeing is done, it's time to take out the basting and give it a good ironing. And onto cutting out the linen pieces. With this layer of fabric, I chalked the sewing lines and also the waistline. On most of the pieces, I then got the linen lined up to the silk and trimmed away the excess silk fabric. This fabric seemed to mostly shrink lengthwise, but hardly any widthwise, just FYI. For the front and side front pieces, before aligning them to the silk, I have some boning channels that I need to place 
These are the only ones that aren't placed on a seam, and that's why I have to do it now before aligning it to the silk. So because of this, I could theoretically machine sew these channels in place, but I decided to hand sew it. I just felt like hand sewing would be finer and would help everything lay smoother. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, I don't know. Either way, it was quite satisfying to hand sew something and then see it all even and nice looking. Anyway, once those were sewn in place, I aligned these pieces to the silk. Now it's time to cut out the silk crepelet. This fabric is pretty wobbly and it's hard to find the straight grain. So I just very roughly cut out my pattern pieces and then got the crepelet ironed. From there, I worked on finding the straight grain of each piece and aligning it correctly, and I did one crepelin layer at a time. That process took some time, to get everything smoothly laid out straight, but then after I got it done, I could baste all these layers together. When basting, I positioned the piece on a curve so I could do the roll pinning technique, which means the outer fabrics have just a little bit more ease in them compared to the under ones, because when the bodice is on your body, you just need a little extra room in those outer fabrics than the under ones. So this roll pinning technique keeps all the layers laying smoothly when it's on a curved body. Once everything is basted, trim away that extra silk crepe line and it's time to assemble the pieces. All the seams for this bodice are pressed open, and we now have something that looks like a bodice. Before moving on, I actually decided to do my hook and eye closure. This is usually something I do in the very last steps of a project, but since I wanted to try on the bodice and make sure everything was looking good, I didn't want to pin the bodice closed in order to do this, so I decided to place the hooks and eyes now. You know, try something new. Also, I added my elastic straps, which are covered in a piece of silk crepelin. Time to try it on. There were actually a couple adjustments I needed to make to this bodice. Also, there isn't boning in the bodice yet. I could have snuck some of them in, but most of them don't have channels yet. The reason being, the channels are going to be right on top of the seams. So if I sewed in the channels, I wouldn't be able to make any adjustments to those seams, and that would have not been fun. Adjustments have been made, onto finishing up the inside. 
All the seams are catch stitched down and then boning channels hand stitched in place. So in case you're thinking about it right now, I did not want to use the seam allowances to create the boning channels. That is a technique and I have used it before in my corset. But I want the boning to lay right on top of the seam and I want it to lay evenly on that seam. Not to one side of the seam or the other, which would need to be the case if I did the seam allowance casing thing. So just FYI, I made a conscious decision to do it this way and not the other way. So with all this hand sewing, my mind tends to wander quite a bit. And when you've got a photo shoot coming up with a bunch of deadlines and there's a list as long as your arm that needs to get done, your mind gets tired of thinking about it. So that's when something like an audiobook to relax or distract your mind comes in handy. And it's here where I get to share about today's sponsor, Chirp Audiobooks. So Chirp doesn't have a monthly subscription, so it's easy to try and there's no commitment involved. And they have amazing limited time offers on audiobooks that are discounted up to 95%. Particularly, I just made a purchase of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo for less than $4 when it's usually $35. That's a big savings. <laughs> A big saving for a lot of content. It might take me several projects to actually get through the whole audiobook, but I've been wanting to listen to the unabridged version of Les Miserables for a long time. I just love Les Mis. Another one I could always listen to is the Chronicles of Narnia series by C.S. Lewis. But anyway, Chirp has so many options, great deals, and no commitment fee. So get your first audiobook 50% off by using promo code BELLAMAY50 on Chirp Audiobooks. Click the link in the description below to see my personal audiobook choices and get your 50% off. And now I think I'm going to go start my 57 hour journey into the world of Jean Valjean. With all the channels placed, it's time to insert my steel boning, close up the ends, and then do the finishing touches. So first, I've got to make the piping for the bottom edge. I used the same iridescent silk fabric as the bodice, and then I threw it in some dye quickly to make it not a stark white, but also it is not the same color as the bodice. This piping gets placed on the bottom edge and at the armholes. Once it's sewn in place, a catch stitch secures the raw edges. I also forgot to film the process of attaching a waist tape and finishing the top edge with just a bias cut piece of linen which creates a facing. On to the Bertha. The under layer is the iridescent fabric used in the skirt and is smaller than all the other layers, at least in my replica. Next is a layer of each of the Umissima type fabrics and then a layer of silk crepelin. This particular fabric wasn't long enough to make it all the way around the bodice, so I needed a seam, and that will be at the center front. This is the only place that a seam can be hidden in the Bertha. And you might notice it's not a seam yet, it's just the edges of the fabric. I will sew them together later on. All the layers are lined up to that iridescent fabric. The outer layers just need to be slightly gathered to fit. and then a quick basting to keep everything in place. The top edge of the Bertha is placed on the bodice and at the elastic, it's not sewn down and there's enough ease in that Bertha edge to allow for the stretch of the elastic. This is important if you want the elastic to do its job. I hand sewed this whole edge in place And then the second edge is pulled over and the raw edges turned under to be hidden. This lower edge is also hand sewn in place. And at the shoulder where the elastic is, the two birth edges are just sewn together to fully contain both raw edges. Again, it's not attached to the elastic, but now it's going to be. I'm just placing a few tacks in between the Bertha and the elastic so it keeps the Bertha in place but doesn't hinder the stretch of the elastic. 
Now that the Bertha is on the bodice, it's time to do the bippity boppity tacks and scrunches to make it look like this. Or at least try to. First, the center front is gathered up. This is where I make the seam between the silk crepelin, basically just grabbing both edges together as I do the gathering stitch. The back edges get the same treatment. And then it's on to a game of playing with the fabric to make it lay correctly. Once it all looks good, some hand sewn tacks get it all secure. Make these tacks loose, don't pull it tight like you would do a regular stitch because it'll make really hard tacks to the Bertha and it won't be quite the same look. So just do loose stitches. A quick little add on, I attach clasps to the bottom edge of the bodice, which will attach to the skirt waistband. And this will keep everything together as I move. Now on to the butterflies. I went pretty basic with these, and I would say I strayed quite a bit from making them completely accurate to the original. I picked a few butterflies that I really liked and sort of stayed in that medium of fabrics and paints and colors. I decided to only do shades of blue, no yellow thrown into the mix. My sister-in-law Erin painted over half of the butterflies, so I am so thankful for that and huge shout out to her for doing that. She also had the idea for the butterfly bodies. So I used to use clay to make the bodies, but they kind of cracked and it was just hard to attach the wings to and then attach them to the Bertha. So she mentioned using fabric and it worked. I first make a little wire body and then cut a bias strip of silk. This fabric gets wrapped around the wire until it's thick enough. Then I did some sewing to secure the fabric and tuck in those raw edges at the top and bottom. And ta-da, you've got a butterfly body. It's not that quick and easy, but that's the process. Now it's just some sewing to attach the painted wings to the body. The final touch was some crystals attached to the wings and bodies of the butterflies. In total, I only did about 20 butterflies. The original dress has something like 32, but honestly, the butterflies are probably my least favorite part. So with a little less of them and in the style I like, it worked out quite well.
Well, there you have it. I am pretty happy with it. Could it be smoother? Yes, it could be. And do you see the ombre die as much as I was hoping for? No. But knowing it's there and occasionally seeing it in certain lighting and different movements, it makes me happy knowing that it's there. So overall, I'm happy. <laughs> and if you're thinking I didn't make it quite low enough in the front and the back, you're correct. I don't feel comfortable with that low of neckline, so I made it comfortable height for me. So overall, I'm happy. This project is officially closed. I am having a hard time knowing how to end this video. There's more coming, not in the making of style video, but in the actual wearing of it. So stay tuned for that. I also have a new shirt design inspired by this project and you can find the links in that down below. And with all that, thank you for watching it. If you have been here since the beginning of this project, well, I mean, thank you so much for supporting and watching all of these videos. It is definitely, it has definitely been a journey. Of course, stay tuned for future projects because there's more coming. And a huge thank you as always to my patrons who are continually supporting me in so many ways. It has been amazing having all of you along for this journey in particular, and also YouTube memberships. Thank you to those of you who have joined over here on YouTube memberships. Thank you so much. And with that, Go into your own sewing area and learn, create, and inspire. And stay tuned for the final reveal of the finished outfit. And we'll see you around.